Good Saturday evening and happy 420 to any of you who are still clear of conscience. Today, we assemble the Nerd Council of Doom in order to take over the world and talk about nerdy things. And my co-hosts, the Dungeon Minister and the Delver of Dungeons, the Dungeon Delver. That is me. How's it going, guys? <laughs> he delves it. I, I minister to it. And between the, the, the two of us, uh, we then, everyone yang. Time tonight. for last rites, sir. Yeah. Everybody yangs out tonight. Everybody yangs out tonight. <laughs> it's all good. Nice. It's all good. I'm having peppermint tea because my throat is a mess. So. Uh-oh. Why is your throat a mess here on 420, Plagiar? I've been, you no, know, <laughs> no, I've been sick since Easter. That's why. So. Oh, oh my God. seeing, hearing too many confessions, huh? <laughs> uh, well, tonight we have an extra special program. It has been a significantly interesting month, or at least within the last few weeks. And there is so much to talk about, but let us start with perhaps something that will make me giggle, uh, and that's Warhammer 40,000. Oh, I got that? Is that me? <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Warhammer is a game I never got into because I was never wealthy enough. I, that's a game I never got into because I didn't even know it existed until someone told me that the guy who played Superman played it. And I went, oh, what is it? <laughs> so I guess it's all Bill. It's all me. Huh? Well, uh, I mean, I, I realize a lot of people out there are going to be cogent of what Warhammer 40K is. And if uh, Yang's uh, face wasn't right there, you could see I actually have some of the Warhammer uh, disorder myself in that I have Space Hulk. But briefly, extremely briefly, Warhammer 40K is a science fantasy war game set in the year 40,000. The Imperium of Man has spread out across, across the galaxy, and in doing so, its empire has run into several other empires of aliens, alien robots, evil demons from, from uh, the warp, um, and a number of other horrible things. Elvin made in. Hello. Good to see you. Um... But uh, the lore of Warhammer 40K, one of the key pieces of the lore of Warhammer 40K is that one of the primary units out there defending humanity are the Space Marines. They are power armored wearing religious monks who... Uh, can fight in vacuum at the bottom of the sea on the surface of like a planet like Mercury with just no problem um, because of their power armor, but also because of their genetic engineering. Uh, you see, when you're an adolescent, if you are deemed suitable to potentially join the ranks of the Adeptus Astartes and Dungeon Minister, if I throw a lot of the pseudo-Latin from 40K out, it's not me. It's Games Workshop. They just kind of mash <laughs> Latin-sounding stuff together. I will not hold you responsible for any uh, pig Latin, junk Latin, Thank you. junk Swedish. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Romans, they go the ouse. But anyway, uh, so the Adeptus Astartes are made from men. And I say they are made from men because the young recruits that start are subjected to things to make them into space Marines that would constitute crimes against humanity. They have a whole bunch of extra uh, organs stuffed in their bodies, cybernetic implants stuffed in their bodies, and only a percentage of them survive this process. Well, that, that's, just, that, that's really just English boarding school for you. <laughs> <laughs> so Explains the royal family. 
yeah so that you are you are basically um you you start out as just the average imperial citizen or above average and by the time they're done with you before they bolt the armor onto you that never ever comes off and i'm i'm gonna share a slide here uh let me see how do i how do i present that uh, uh, on screen yang do you have to do that oh wait hang on hang on i just need to switch the format there we go okay so yeah that guy all the way over here that's a normal human, normal human citizen of the empire. And when they're done with you, you look like this. And you might think, hey, that's kind of awesome. That's kind of got the Charles Atlas thing going on. It, it's not. It's it's horrific. And you're brainwashed. I should point that out. Like John Smith over here doesn't like think of the times when he hung out with his family and went to went to uh, Emperor Day cookouts and you know what his his job was like working at the spaceport free uh, a duty free store or anything like that because your mind is emptied out by the time you get to this point you're 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 done as far as being a human um the reason it is all men it was established in the lore all the way back in 1989 that men have the genetic structure that can accept the horrible things that the imperial scientists want to do. It, it, it doesn't work on women. It just, it doesn't. And good, because who would sign up for that, right? But, and this is important. This is important. Um, there are there are folks in the hobby who've believed for years, and they've gotten more vociferous because, yay, internet, that the um, that there should be women space marines, and if you're a casual gamer and you don't play 40k, your response might be, "Well, yeah, Bill, there should be women's. Why not? Why are you being so exclusive?" And now, uh, Yang, if you'll take that uh, down for just a hot second while I get the rest of the the rest of the uh, the slides in order here, um. So yeah, why aren't there women in 40k? Miss Mr. Yanzo, if you put that back up. This is all canonical art. Uh guards women. There are trillions and trillions and trillions of foot soldiers who don't get brainwashed, whose bodies are not literally hollowed out and made into a nest for synthetic organs and and um cybernetic implants who join just the regular army, the militia Astartes, the, the, um, the, the, the guardsmen, and they don't care if you're a man or woman. If you're tall enough to reach the trigger, you can join the, uh, the, um, the, the militia. And now some people might think, well, that's not very glamorous, Bill. Why don't, so you're just saying, yeah, you can be a disposable grunt. You don't get powered armor. You don't get cool models. And to that, I say, these sisters of battle, the nuns with guns and lots of other less, <laughs> more, more get deleted on from YouTube for saying it kinds of things. Sisters of battle point for point, are as tough as space marines. Sisters of battle are still normal humans. They are religious fanatics for the emperor. They worship the god emperor, and they spread the god emperor's singular truth across the galaxy. Three-fifths, this is lore stuff. You guys are going to have to dive down into lore with me. Three-fifths of the space marines turned traitor. Three-fifths of them became traitors during the Horus heresy. Humanity was very close to dying out. No sisters of battle have ever gone over to chaos. None, ever. They would rather die. And given the choice between die or turn to chaos, they would rather die. They are literally uncorruptible. And you can build a whole unique army of sisters of battle. The Sisters of Silence. The Sisters of Silence are like the Sisters of Battle, except no magic works on them. 
they li- the, if you, in AD and D terms, that's like walking around with an anti magic field all the time. Demons, psychers, psychic weapons doesn't work on them. But what about aliens? Commander Shadow Sun, the 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 military leader of the Tau, an alien race you can play in 40k. Commander Shadow Sun is is female. The Tau's military is literally led by a woman. On the Eldar or Elf side, the the Eldar themselves, they're about it's about a 50-50 split. Men and women in Eldar. Dark Eldar, that is Eldar that follow chaos, same thing. They, they, they seem to come from very warm planets. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Not a lot of cold worlds, not a lot of cold craft worlds. No Hoth uh, for them. The, the simple reality is there has a always been representation of female models. There is an in-game explanation of why there are no female space marines. They would die. And no male sisters of battle. And no male sisters. There are male members of the ecclesiarchy, but they're not allowed to, 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 uh, to be sisters of battle. Misters of battle. <laughs> there are yeah, no misters from battle. another mister. Yeah, exactly. No misters of battle. Um, so this has been established for 40 years. A tiny vociferous minority of people have been screeching for the last few years. Gosh darn it, GW, why don't you give us uh, male, uh, female space marines? Why don't you put women in space marine armor? Let's set aside your request for inclusion there and turn it around a bit. Why do you hate Sisters of Battle? Why why, why do you hate Sisters of Silence? I, I mean, there, there are perfectly capable armies that I would argue are better looking in terms of overall uh, design than a lot of Space Marine units. But we can have that argument later. Games Workshop just casually dropped an updated lore book that said, oh, yeah, there have been uh, female uh, Adeptus Custodius now for uh, 10,000 years. Hold up a second. So the Adeptus Custodius are space marines that live on Terra, that live on Earth, and guard the emperor. The emperor is in a coma. Oh, no. Oh, no. It's serious. Um, the The emperor is like in this state of living death, and there is an Imperial unit that just guards the Emperor to make sure nobody comes in and unplugs his life support. And they're called the Adeptus Custodus. And there's books that say that that the nobles of Terra, any of them would be proud to have their sons become a member of the Adeptus Custodus, because the Adeptus Custodus are, as you might imagine, they have to be not just the best of the best, like Space Marines are, but the best of them. So they just casually dropped over the week. Oh, yeah, yeah, 10,000 years. There have been uh, female Adeptus Custodus, which means, you know, female space marines. And so I started digging around on this. Adeptus Custodus to the... T- <laughs> Yes. Adeptus Custodus. Sorry. <laughs> um, so they, they started changing their canon, and I dug into this, and I, I can't find the post, but the reasoning is very simple. Uh, and it's it, two words. And Dungeon Minister actually hit on this earlier. Henry Cavill. Henry Cavill just blurted out in an interview or on social media, I'm working on a Warhammer 40K uh, TV series. Games Workshop had not announced this. The Games Workshop employee that Henry Cavill was working with, and they were talking to, I can't remember if it was Netflix or Amazon, Amazon. uh, Amazon, did not have the authority to sign off on it, yet he did. And in a nutshell, he handed 
GW's IP to Amazon. And then Cavill yeah. came out and said, hey, we're doing a 40K show. So the powers that be in Amazon are almost... It, the, the word is, inside GW, they are livid. And even if this show hits it out of the park, heads are going to roll for this because of the creative power it gives Amazon over Warhammer 40K. Well, now, now, they have never taken an existing IP and treated it with anything other than the utmost of respect, Bill. You know this. Oh, mo most certainly. <laughs> most certainly, yeah. I, I mean, of course, they, they have, they have, uh, they have delicately and gently handled canon on, on, Just... on the very tips of their gloved fingers. So basically somebody at Amazon probably brought up the question, well, how come there aren't female uh, space dudes, the, the armored space guys? How come those don't exist? And so somebody said, quick, put it in a book real quick that there have always been women space marines. This has got fans up in arms over it and of course there's two sides of the argument there's people who are angry that this that this lore change has happened and then there are people that are like shut up mis misogynists shut up you right wing uh uh you know women haters so that's where we find ourselves today uh with with this this controversy um in a single fell swoop to appease their television masters GW has started having to alter the lore. Elvin made in is angry, and I don't blame you. So that, so, is, that is the new for news. That is the new. That is the news from the 40k front. Well, not that I want to defend Amazon here, but uh, I have, uh, you know, I have a passing familiarity with uh, Warhammer, and hasn't this stuff been coming up for the last several years? I mean, it's not just right now that they've been that there have been rumblings of change in lore it's been three four years at least right well this it's been this called is woke hammer and ham warmer um <laughs> ham warmer forty thousand in the grim darkness of the future would you like a thin slice um no the uh the warhammer uh the warhammer franchise has not been changed though they haven't changed. They, they, you know, they they've released statements that hey, uh, you know, Warhammer is for everybody, and uh, you know, you you better, uh, you 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 better uh, welcome everyone to the table, and so on and et cetera. And I don't, on paper, disagree with those decisions, but now they're like, yeah, hey, uh, there have been female Space Marines for ten thousand years, by the way, and. It just, it, it literally, I mean, it, it would be like, uh, imagine you get to uh, the last chapter of The Lord of the Rings, and it's like, oh yeah, orcs have always lived in Hobbiton. They have for the last few hundred years. I didn't bother to mention it in, in, in any of the rest of the book, but I, I'm telling you that now. Um so that's that's kind of where we find ourselves now. Uh, for me, uh, I, I'm just kind of curious. Uh, why didn't anyone sort of see this coming before? Because we've seen this basically in D and D, Magic: The Gathering, comic books, uh, any of the mainstream and image comic books. Um, we've seen it, um, you know, in all and all these other media's. And it seems like they're finally filtering down. Not that Warhammer 40K is smaller, but it's not the biggest of the role-playing games. But it seems like now it's even filtering down to that. Um, and to be honest, I was kind of surprised that it hadn't already happened before. Uh, and there's there's more stuff that goes with it. Um, I read an article, which unfortunately I can't find at the moment, but um, if you're on Twitter, follow Grums, who was one of the original... Uh, World of Warcraft mm -hmm. devs, uh, and he mentions how there is a company that is all about like DEI focus that uh, essentially replaced 
the Warhammer um, fan subs on Reddit by insinuating themselves in and then basically just taking over. Um, so a am I the only one who expected this? I, I mean... Oh, no, literally, literally, the first thing I knew about Warhammer was that Henry Cavill played it. The second thing I knew about Warhammer was that there was a dispute about female space marines. So, I mean, honestly, it was it was um, DM James. Uh, I don't know what he's calling it. Uh, DM, the James gang. DM James had a bit about why there shouldn't be female space marines. And this was two years ago, three years ago. Mm. So, uh, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I'm I'm frankly shocked it has taken this long. And, you know, yeah. you know, what cracks me up is the pushback is, why do you hate women? You chud. And I'm like. Why do you want women to literally be mutilated? Because that's what has to happen before you become a space marine. Sisters of Battle are just as competent. And Emmy, you play you play 40k. Elvin made in in the chat. She plays 40k. Okay. You you full well know that Sisters of Battle are absolutely as deadly on the battlefield as as full bore space marines. She, she, posted, she posted a comment earlier saying they actually have a better record in tournament play. Yeah, yeah, they do. They they absolutely yep. do. Uh, and Horace Heresy the has sixty plus books, two hundred plus novels in Warhammer forty k universe, and female custodians were never mentioned. So, you know, it, it's it's never been, it's never been a thing. Stop trying to make it a thing. Sisters of Battle are completely awesome on their own. And if you come in and say, yeah, but female Space Marines, all you're telling me is you hate Sisters of Battle. Not that you love 40K. Because honestly, if you said, what army do you want to field, Bill? I would, I would happily, readily do that if I played enough 40K. But as it is, I just, I just enjoy Space Hulk. Which you can easily adapt any models into, I should point out, but that's not. That's <laughs> Kobayashi Maru, indeed, Vaughn. Kobayashi Maru, indeed. Yeah. Uh, you know, to me too, this gets to kind of a, a deeper issue, and it's not specifically are there female space marines? Are there? Um, but it has to do more with canon because that's the common theme that runs through all of these different uh, fandoms, franchises, whatever you want to call them, is that people want to change the canon. So what do you guys think that canon is important? And uh, if so, why? Unquestionably, it creates the landscape and it, it creates familiar touchstones. It, it, you know, um, yeah, you I, know what? I, it's it's if, if you're asking if you're selling a product in which people will then um, take part and they will construct their own stories and experiences in it. Like if, if you're writing a series of books and you want to get to, you know, book seven of your eight book series and suddenly flip the script. That's it's your book, right? I'm reading it, it's your book. But if you're selling a game what you're selling is a set of tools for someone else to create the world, the, the, the battles. I mean, it's a game. You're playing a game, but there's it's a story game. There's a story behind the game. It's not just rolling dice and looking at numbers. It's, you know, there's warriors and, and all this kind of stuff. There's a narrative. So you're asking, you're, you're selling the ability to create your own narrative. And you're selling a set of ingredients, right? Here's the ingredients to bake an apple pie. This is everything you need to bake an apple pie. And you get home with your apple pie kit and you open it up. It's like, oh, kidding, key lime. And there's nothing wrong with key lime pie, but that's not what I bought. I bought apple, you right? And so to me, it's it's when you, when companies that mess around with the lore, it's bait and switch. It's like, you know, we told you that this was what you were buying, but well, no, we've, we've slid some other stuff in there, right? It just... You know, there, there, there's endless possibilities for making new new worlds, new games, new systems, right? So taking an existing one and one where people, from what I, I, I don't know Warhammer 
that well. But from what I understand, it's big tournament play and playing down to the local game shop because it's it's something that gets really involved and it's more fun to try yourself against different opponents. So it's less like the D&D group, which is like the same four or five people. It's bigger because you want to try against different people's armies, different opponents. And so you need a common set of rules. And so when that gets messed with, you really have sold people one bill, you know, one bill of goods and you're giving them something else. Yeah. I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and then on the back end, when you have people who've enjoyed the hobby, you know, forever, I, I'm sorry that, it, you know, maybe it's a bit much to go into, but it isn't just about 40 K it's, it's like, you know, uh, what is it? Wizards of the Coast. You know, they've said, oh, well, Bigby's a gnome. Ha ha, get it? His name is Bigby, but he's a gnome. He's small. He's not big. He's small. Get it? Isn't that funny? Gary's character, Bigby, is not a gnome. All right? Just like Gary's character, Morden, kind of wasn't bald. Um, it, It's... Eh. You're you're literally pulling a. We have always been at war with East Asia. Move when you do that. You know you're you're gaslighting the fans. If you slowly change something, if you come back and say, "Hey, guess what? Just for Custodus, because of the psychic power of the Emperor on Terra, he that that you know we found us a a, a a a genetic template that allows." only Terran Custodes to be female, and this is a brand new thing that's just happening, that's a lot cooler than, you know, no, we've gone back and we've changed all of that. You know, we, we changed the past. Wizards of the Coast put out, back when 4th edition was released, um, a series of TV ads where they showed the stereotypical people playing D&D in the 70s. And it's like, you know, they had a pink eraser stuck on a couple of paper clips. Like, well, this is our troll, you know, blah, blah. You know, it's like miniatures didn't exist back then. And then people in the 80s, and it was like a badly done metal mini, like, oh, this is the troll. And then finally, like, oh, it's 2008, 2009, and, you know, uh, the game remains the same and you know now the minis look proper and it's like a troll finally looks like a troll um, we didn't we weren't idiots back in the 70s and 80s the way we we weren't beating rocks together a certain number of times to determine what our die roll was I, I was um, sorry. Well, sorry. Don't want okay. to let the team down but that was exactly what I was doing uh, okay all right I took uh, math rocks seriously there you go. Um, but the, again, I, I hate to overuse it. You know, so we've always been at war with East Asia. That was how you always played D&D back then. Well, it really was. And yes, it was because we said so. There have always um, been female custodists. No, there they really have it. Yes, it is because we said so. You know, I, I want to just touch on something Vaughn mentions of the comics. Uh, the, you know, retcons happen in, in comics all the time, mm. which is absolutely true. But I, I would go back to what I was saying earlier, that that is a receptive form of pop culture. I still don't really agree with it. Like, you know, when you if you want to get, you know, representation of 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 groups that haven't been seen in comic books before, that's fabulous. Write a comic about it i mean black panther was a, a, it was a, an attempt an extraordinarily successful attempt to do just that one of the you know great lines in the in the in the, the comic series in the marvel series um and you know when they go back and they make oh no this is not actually how thor came to be or this is not actually how you know, whatever um it, it what it always has felt like to me is this comic has jumped the shark so hard that our only opportunity, our only possible means of, of getting it back on the rails is to hard, do a hard reboot. But while I don't 
like that when it happens in in comics and it's still a receptive uh art form you know they draw it they write it they color it they ink it they set you know, and you just buy it and read it but a game is a different thing because you're they're giving you the tools to do your own thing and so you're you are an active participant in the creation of this world now on the one hand you could say well you just don't use that rule but if it is something that ends up in tournament play and play down to the, at the, the local game shop, then you do need to have a common language, right? And maybe maybe space you know, female space marines don't throw off any game mechanic. But from, I think, every, our, our past experience, if a company will do a cosmetic change to the lore, they will do... A, a functional change to the lore where the dice are doing different things and the, the guns don't operate the same anymore. And so you're really changing the what happens. Again, I would go to, the, it's, it's a receptive versus participatory art form. And when it's a participatory one, you know, everyone has bought into a certain lore, rules, etc. And it, it, tinkering with it, you're now tinkering with what someone else is doing. You're forcing someone else into into a, a, a change rather than just putting it in your comic book and if you don't like it read a different comic book you're receiving it but with a game you're participating so. yeah you know it's an interesting point um games are a very different medium so if you want to talk about comics movies tv shows um there were things that we liked back in the days that have been retconned and changed in horrible ways but we'll always have those stories that we liked before, you know? Um, and, and even in before the current questionable epoch that we find ourselves in, uh, there were horrible retcons. Uh, if you go back and, and read the old X-Men comics, um, it started, they, they started a, an quote unquote alternate timeline with days of future past. And then it's like everybody and their brother also had to start timelines. And it was so confusing um, I, I don't even know what you can call real, real canon for that anymore. Um, or, you know, how how bad was midichlorines? You know what I mean? That that was pretty awful for Jedi. <laughs> uh, you know, but the one of the nice things for me about uh, tabletop role playing games is, you know, not only can you can you just say, oh, screw it, we're playing an older edition. Even in the current editions, when they change things. Uh, you know, people can say, you know, if I'm running the game, I can say, uh, yeah, no female space marines. That's it. And it makes me wonder, you know, these tournaments, if they're official or not, uh, how many of them are just going to say like, mm, we're not using those new rules. We're just going to go by these classic rules. <laughs> If they're going to be sanctioned tournaments, they're going to have to do exactly what Games Workshop tells them to do and to get the support, free models to give out, gift certificates to give out, mm -hmm. paint sets to give out, a, a place to play, be it in a game store or some floor space at a convention. They're going to have to do what Games Workshop tells them to do. And, you know, Yang, if you and I are playing or Dungeon Minister, if you and Yang are playing or whatever, um, boo, uh, then you you are going to do what GW tells you to do. Um, and that that is that is the problem with 40K and this lore change. Um, now, you don't have to build, <clears throat> excuse me, you don't have to build your army any one way or the other, but Dungeon Minister talked about uh, uh, talked about um, mechanical changes that follow in cosmetic changes. I mean, you know, if you showed up at a, uh, I think the the rule for GW is eighty five percent of your plastic has to be GW plastic. So like you could have like a little kit bashed antenna pack on a Marine's back. And you could do that for your whole army or, you know, swap hands for weapons or or do whatever. Um, but uh, it, they have to be official GW models in the overall. So, like, if you took a, a bunch of Sisters of Battle 
and a bunch of space marines because there are space marine models that they sell that don't have the big bulky helmets on them so you can have a face so you buy a bunch of those you snip off their heads or you don't put them on you buy a bunch of sisters of battle models and you stick those head and you say hey here's my female space marines and you play that in a tournament at least for certain tournaments that's going to fly but once you get into GW saying, well, we're going to change it so that female Adeptus Custodus do this, that's different. Now you've got a, you've got a, a whole can of worms you've opened and you've, you've got to deal with, with this sudden onrush of changes. They're going to alter how people have been playing and enjoying the game and if they don't like it if they're like look no man i you know i just can't can we not just have adeptus custodus function as they normally did on the field we'll get out of our tournament then uh so yeah that that brings me uh to one of two questions one um do you as the official 40k fan here do you see this as maybe a time when uh there will be an increase in non-sanctioned tournaments will people just start saying you know screw it we'll do it ourselves perhaps some of these smaller kit making companies will say hey we'll, we'll donate a few kits to this kind of stuff to increase their own prestige uh number one and number two are we perhaps looking at a warhammer 40k fork much like we saw Pathfinder in um, in the D and D space. Well, the good news is that fork already already exists. There's a company called One Page Rules, and literally they make a rule set for for smashing your little plastic men together uh, that is one page long. It's hmm. it's that. And you can play it with 40K miniatures. You can use pennies. You can use nice rocks that you found in your garden, whatever. Your old um, G.I. Joe figures. G old G.I. Joe figures. Just, just use whatever and play a 40K-like game. There's your Pathfinder fork. And I think you're going to see a thin but noticeable amount. Now, what I think uh, of people going off... What I think GW is hoping is that by creating the Amazon uh, 40K series, they're going to pull in more and more and more and more and more casuals is, is what you're, what you're going to see. Um, so I, I think, I think that is, is what is what that's going to be your, your Pathfinder fork, whether or not that makes GW pump the brakes and change lore or something like that, which again, as was said in the comments, if they said, oh, hey, we discovered some new science, now there can be female space marines of this, then then they can just as easily roll that back and say, oh, nope, didn't work. But they've dug their heels in and said, no, they've always existed. We've always been at war with East Asia. So they've kind of painted themselves creatively into a corner. So um, I, I, I feel uh, like... From for my experience, the pumping of the brakes does not happen. It is slam on the accelerator. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, this and again, I just to get my foil hat on and go Alex Jones on the subject. This is something that came from the, the the sudden announcement, which GW probably wasn't ready to do, of the TV show for Amazon, and Amazon said, "Why no, why no women?" And uh, they're to making which the I space marines girls. Yeah, to which I <laughs> they're, they're putting something in the lore that's making the space marines girls. <laughs> um, why not introduce sisters of battles as, as characters? Yeah. You would have more happier sisters of battle army players than you would this tiny thin fringe of shrieking people on YouTube and Twitter 
the the like 10 people total on Twitter and the 50 on Reddit who who are big who were big mad because there were no female space marines. So well, I- I know, Sisters of Battle is such a cool name. I'm gonna have it to is, that. and the yeah. models are awesome. They, they, I mean, they got the Betty Page haircut. They got power armor. They got swords. Their primary weapon, Padre, is flame. They, they straight up burn things that they don't like. <laughs> Touchberry would be pleased. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> get get touch go go on eBay and 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 buy an old metal Sisters of Battle army somebody has painted up and doesn't want it anymore and get them on that Sisters of Battle grind set. <laughs> there you go. Um but anyway, I I I think I I think I've said pretty much all, you know. Well, in continuing our theme of controversies in the tabletop world, <laughs> Uh, we had some exciting news coming out of Watsi this week. Well, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so was, uh, let so me, uh, minorly exciting. I, I let you know though, I've, I've been actually named the new president of Watsi. And so nice. we are, um, we're bringing out a new whole new set of rules and, uh, this is the, the cover that we're going with. And, um, yeah, we think it's going to it could catch on. <laughs> Uh, that is oh, fake that news. Works. I have been I have been uh, announced the new president of Watsi, and it's all first edition AD and D and Greyhawk now. I'm um, Spartacus. I am Spartacus. Okay, so this is uh, Lorraine. Oh my God, <laughs> Cynthia Williams. Cynthia Williams uh, has resigned really from Wizards of the again. Coast. Uh, hire, yeah, hire Lorraine Williams and then fire her, won't you? Uh, so yeah, Cynthia Williams. Uh, oh, and by the way, this uh, this is Retail Dive is the company. Uh, if you guys want that link, uh, just look up Retail Dive. But this is by uh, Karen Vembar, senior editor over yonder. Uh, Cynthia, Cynthia Williams, president of Wizards of the Coast and Hasbro Gaming, announced her resignation from Hasbro on Monday. She'll exit on April the 26th, according to a filing with the Securities and Exchange Commission. Um, Hasbro is looking at internal and external candidates to be a successor. The company did not immediately respond to questions regarding Williams' exit. Uh, she jumped on board. She, she came on in 2022 for Microsoft. Um, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. Is that really how Chris, Chris Cox is spelled? Yes. Hmm. It's not C-O-X. I got, I got to tell you, I now have some real empathy because I went through school as an O'Rear, so... No, dude, dude, I, I know the pain. Sorry, get back to you. Sorry, didn't the other up there. Uh, or anyway, uh, at the time of her appointment, Chris Cox, who was then serving as a president and COO of Wizards, uh, stated that Williams brought a deep understanding of tech and e-commerce, along with cloud and console-based gaming. Uh, Cox, soon after that statement, became the company's CEO. Williams succeeded him, who during his uh, time with Wizards of the Coast doubled its revenue from 2018 to 2021. Lie, lie. Chris Cox did not. COVID did. Oh yeah, yeah. Yep. Chris Cox had nothing to do with it. I'm sorry. I that's like saying that uh, Jeff Bezos doubled Amazon's uh, uh, door deliveries between from uh, 2020 to 2022. Mm-hmm. He had nothing to do with it. It was everything to do with that damn. Uh, super flu. Anyway, in 2023, Wizards of the Coast and digital gaming segment saw a 10 percent increase in revenue because of Baldur's Gate three. Let's be 100% clear about yep. that also. You take away Baldur's Gate 3, you take away COVID, and these are two people lashed to a more abundant company. And that's it. Uh, but the company's outlook for 2024 is Wizard's segment will uh, decrease between 3 and 5% with an operating margin of 38% to 40%. And they're scheduled to release their Q1 2024 earnings on Wednesday I am definitely going to drop a video about that. I normally don't talk about that sort of thing, but um, so here's what's interesting about it. Was she fired or did she quit? Why would she quit on the eve of the release of sixth edition? 
why would she quit right when she was going to put that feather in her cap of saying she shepherded in a new edition of D&D? That is something that personnel at Wizards of the Coast want to, to say is their high watermark because there's always an uptick in sales when a new edition comes out. I don't care if you hated 3.5. I don't care if you hated 4E. When those editions came out, sales took off because people want the new shiny. It's always been the case. All the way back when AD&D was released and there was groaning from original D&D grognards, there was, you know, an uptick in sales. And, and you know, Gary and, and Brian Bloom and Kevin Bloom said, our company has seen just skyrocketing sales of Dungeons & Dragons. When 2E came out, look at the sales are huge compared to AD&D. When 3E came out, look at our sales compared to, to 2E, 4E, and 5E. They've always seen an uptick. Why would she leave if she knew that was coming? Well, why, why did Nixon resign? You know, he just won an election. That is a good point, and I hadn't been thinking about that. Dungeon Minister, expand on that. Well, no, I mean, you know, she perfectly, I don't you know, forced out, fired, resigned. You resign when the company doesn't want bad press. You, you resign when the company doesn't want to deal with, um, oh, look, this is messed up. They're not doing well. They want to hold on to everything sunshine and rainbows because of course they do like what company wants to go on record saying yeah we're in trouble you know so you resign because um because you will you will be fired otherwise it'll look better for you you'll get another job easier you know you're exploring other things and you know i think that's why people in the kind of positions like that resign you can you can be thrown on your sword or you can you can voluntarily throw yourself upon your sword. Yeah, and you'll just you'll look better. You'll have more marketability afterward. Right. See, yeah. I'm I'm not a hundred percent. You know, Vaughn says it was mentioned in the speakeasy that she's a scapegoat. That is entirely possible. However, there have been occasions when people see what's coming down the pipe is so bad they jump ship while they have the chance. Because if she leaves now. Yeah, maybe she doesn't get that bump from D and D one or sixty or whatever they're going to call it, but she's still on a Baldur's Gate three high, where she can claim credit for all of that. Um, my sense is, you know, my my prediction with whatever the next version of D and D is, is it is going to be a super hard sell. Because right now, 5th edition is the largest cohort of D&D players that there's ever been. And they've already spent a crap ton of money on all the products. Uh, so, you know, getting them to just ditch everything and buy new stuff, that's a hard sell, you know, when I still have old uh, campaign guides from 5e. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it, it could be that she was, she was fired. Uh, she was a sacrifice to Moloch in order to appease the masses. Um, but uh, this lady, you know, I think she has enough smarts to to jump ship. And she's already sort of done the damage. I don't think there would be any upside because even though sales might increase, I bet you the sales are going to be way under whatever they're targeting. Well, I mean, they're they're talking about a three to five percent dip. Um, I think Wednesday, I think we're going to get a stock report Wednesday that's going to make her look like General Patton because she is going to outmaneuver that by not being there when it happens. Uh, and there's also one other strategy, which is uh, if we go back to Disney's recent history, uh, you had Bob Iger. He retired. And then uh, Bob Chapek became CEO. Well, Bob Iger had already gummed up the work so bad with so many terrible movies that, you know, movies take two, three years to to make. Oh, so, minimum. Minutes. So, 20 yeah. if you go back to development, right? Yeah. Yeah. They're so when Chapek came in, there were already tons of terrible movies in production. Uh, the parks have been screwed up by cost-cutting measures. Um, and 
you still had Bob Iger's, all of Bob Iger's people in places of power around the company. So Chapek became the scapegoat that way. And then what was a uh, six months later, a year later, Bob Iger comes back. Oh, well, I have to write all these wrongs that happened under this guy. Uh, and he's still there today. So there could be some, some of that going on. Yeah. You, you know, uh, Watsy's staff is cut pretty thin, and uh, I don't see it getting any better. So the question is, you know, what what are what do these people have left to rule over? Maybe it's better just to let the bombs hit the ground, and then she could come back and say, "Well, you know, I was the last CEO to make a big profit. Uh, I'll I'll certainly come back and help you out this time." It's the, 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 the hockey penalty box version of, uh, of resignation, right? Yeah. The, yep. the, one who, the one who throws the punch never gets in trouble. So when he responds, so well, yeah, the person the who comes that, in to try to, to try to deal with it, will will get the blame. The one thing that I've seen in, co in corporate settings, a lot of times is you, is you see uh, the bridging departure where basically she goes back to Microsoft, mm -hmm. but she's already laid the groundwork for, being involved at Wizards of the Coast, and she basically paves a lane, a two-way lane, and the collaboration becomes so intermixed that it almost becomes indistinguishable, and then, bam, you wake up two years from now, and all of Wizards of the Coast Digital is being handled by Microsoft. Oh, yep. man, that means that you're like halfway through a session. You're just about to enter you know, the ogre layer for the big battle and then update. And everyone just sits around waiting for the game to update. Oh, you, you love, you love on game your, time and your books, your books won't open or they won't, they'll open real slowly. Or, 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 you know, you won't have had the $150 for a dungeon master's guide for a player's handbook and for a monster manual, you will be running that that game off of your tablet through yeah. Microsoft's servers. Mm -hmm. And that situation you described, Dungeon Minister, is exactly what happens. But we can we can talk about VTDs and software another time. But I, I definitely think there is a possibility that she is leaving enough infrastructure, by which I mean people that she knows in place mm -hmm. at Wizards of the Coast. She's going back to Microsoft, but what she's in fact doing is is you know building that bridge and then the next thing you know they're they're absorbed by a different company yeah or or maybe not even uh coming back to watsi but coming back to Hab hasbro mm, could be I a, think a, a lot of divisions yeah a lot of online games Stuff. The the tell the tell is going to be where she lands and how she lands there as to whether or not she got fired or whether she quit if she goes to Microsoft and winds up as back to Microsoft and winds up as like, you know, something at Zenimax or 343 or something like that, and we never hear from her again, uh, she probably quit and is just trying to ride out the shit storm. Yep. But if she makes an announcement that she's just taking a step back to spend time with family, i.e. she can't get another job then yeah she was almost certainly terminated so, so that that's that's my hot take on it folks um so i guess the real question then is if you were ceo what would you do with watsy well i already said I already yeah said. Bring, bring already back. got his uh already all, got his all five all five of these box sets oh yeah yeah um, and they won't cost you fifty-five bucks a piece. I'll tell you that right now. I would. I to be. If I'm going to be completely honest, I wouldn't do too much different. Um, I mean, because what once it, when you're when you're in the C-suite, man, creatives don't want to see you. They <laughs> really don't want you coming down into their ranks. They don't want to see you walking through that part of the company unless it's like planned. They don't. You know. They just don't. Um, I would leave them be for the most part. What I would do 
is uh, I would divest from BlackRock. Uh, if, if I, if I was, if I, if I had enough authority in the company, because BlackRock is really invested in Hasbro and that's, that's a like, okay, Bill, where are you going to come up with $1.1 billion? Um, Lotto or whatever their share is, but I would, uh, I, I, I wouldn't do that much different except I would put all the old editions under Creative Commons. That's what I was going to say. Mm-hmm. Is, is 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 quit the sort of witch hunt against anything old. All old editions are in Creative Commons. I would then, I would then, uh, just as Wizards of the Coast has worked with Drive Through RPG, I would continue to work through, with Drive Through RPG. But I would tell them everything is print on demand now. This scatter shot, you know, you can get the first and third module from this set print on demand, but not the second one. I mean, come on, guys. Isn't that, though, isn't yeah. that probably down to some legal issue with some artist or some writer who won't Could play be. ball? I mean, is that, I because know. why Why would that choice be made otherwise if it wasn't there's someone involved in some stage of the production of one of those modules who refuses to play ball? You used to well, you used to be able to get a pod copy of um, the World of Greyhawk set in a single volume. It was awesome. You can't now. You can get a PDF of it, but you can't get a you can't get a print on demand copy. Um, for, there was a while when just you couldn't get a Monster Manual. MM One was just not available on on print on demand. Uh, so it, it kind of, I would basically, I would step up and say, look, do what you need to do. I'll, 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 I'll take a cut. I'll take a pay cut for you guys to go on eBay and find clean copies. If it's a matter of getting a clean copy to scan, we'll do that. I'll hire some temps to retypeset the things that need to be retypeset. If even the clean copies aren't good enough, but for God's sake, let's get all just you know, I want gamer to laugh, push button, receive, receive D and D book, and I would make it all accessible again. Wizards of the Coast since two thousand has been leaving money on the ground, not allowing old editions back into the OGL. They could shut down. DCC. They could shut down anybody publishing Osric. They could shut down anybody publishing Swords and Wizardry, anybody publishing Blue Home, etc., 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 by saying, hey, Dungeon Minister, you want to release your campaign set? Go ahead. You, you, the, your Honeywood? You, you want to sell Honeywood? Go ahead. Basic D&D is now it, 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 j- just stick the OGL in there. Uh, OGL now covers it or publish it under Creative Commons, whatever you're more comfortable with. And the amount of goodwill, that would be literally an endless ocean. It wouldn't be a wellspring. It would be an endless ocean of goodwill of that Wizards of the Coast could forever point at and say, we did right by everybody from the 50 and 60 year old guys who finally remember OD&D all the way to the people who played 5e it's that simple and that's yeah. what i would do that is literally all well, i would need to do and hmm. then and then you know if you if you then were selling you put all those things on the print on demand you'd make a fortune because you know you're going to get the grognards who are writing their own campaign settings yes. using systems from the past and so now you're going to have people who want to buy those who you know um so yeah, I mean that would that would be that'd be a money maker. It would it wouldn't rival the the five E line or one D and D to rule them all, whatever's coming next. But it would be up there. It would it would not it would not be an insignificant source of cash. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I'd even sort of go one further where I agree, um, putting it all into uh, public domain and uh, doing print on demand. But I would also have like official um like really nice quality prints you know get some leather bounds and stuff you could even crowdfund that uh to make sure that the, the demand is there 
But yeah, I mean, in addition, time Hasbro had crowdfunded something mm-hmm. before. I've got the the Hero Quest set. This is Hasbro, and they crowdfunded that. Yep. Uh, in addition, I would go on a marketing campaign to make peace with the various Dungeons and Dragons community. I would introduce a uh, series of videos on YouTube, of course, where you take people who are noted in different eras of D&D uh, to all get together and play a game. So maybe uh, you would have, um, I don't know, Matt Mercer and uh, Joe Manganella playing uh, a game that the Dungeon Delver is running in um, 1E. And then maybe we would have the Dungeon Minister playing in a 3.5E game with some other people. And oh, I would I, just I, have... I it. did that once. Oh, man. No? That, the, the, the amount of math, I did not do well at math at school. <laughs> Good heavens. A buff? What buff? What are you buffing me? What buff? What's buff? So, oh, yeah, I mean, I like that's... Idea. You know, why, why not? Because then you can expose new versions. Uh, so, let's say if you got a bunch of 5e players and they saw a 1e game, they thought, oh, that was pretty cool. Then they can go buy it. Uh, the nice new leather-bound edition you're selling. Yeah, I, I mean, there, there's so much they could do, to, and it's so effortless. I, d- let me tell you, I, Stephen Radney McFarlane is, uh, he, he was a, a dev for Wizards of the Coast, swell guy, great guy. I've had him on the show once before. I want to have him on again. He, what we have said, he told Wizards of the Coast they needed to do back in 2007, and the response from Hasbro was, Stephen, you just don't see the big picture. What big picture is there? There's people that want to play classic D&D and they don't want to get sued out of existence because they want to make a few shekels selling a module, supporting an edition that they love. Yep. I, 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 I did literally it defies logic that, 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 that they, they act like anything. And they're going to, let me tell you, tell you something, 5e fans, if you're watching this, if, you, if you're like, uh, we're just three old men yelling at clouds, it's going to happen to you. You're going to be the ugly addition that they push into the corner and pretend doesn't exist come 2025, 2026. It's going to happen to you. All right. Everything's an antique eventually. 4E players were crowing about how they'd finally purged D&D of all of its nasty, disgusting old baggage. And they had a run of seven years and Wizards of the Coast got on their knees and crawled to fans of older editions and apologized and released 5e, which while it's not uh, it, it, it's not exactly AD&D or OD&D has a lot more in common with older editions. And those 4e fans, the four Avengers, as we call them, freaked out. Oh, you're throwing away the objectively best edition of D&D that ever were. So you 5e guys, you, you're looking at us, you're, you're thinking, you know, again, old men yelling at clouds. You will be the grognards in 16 months. You will be the guys being forgotten about. You will be going, what, why won't you support this edition anymore, wizards? Now, now, Bill, you say 16 months. Has, has there been an announcement of like it's actually happening? Because yes. I thought it was supposed to, I thought they were supposed to the utopia was already supposed to be ushered in. 60 is uh it's gonna start rolling in later this summer slash spring. They're gonna stagger <laughs> it like they have always done releases of of D D books. So we're gonna start with Monster Manual and then we're gonna get uh Player's Handbook and then we're gonna get Dungeon Master's Guide. So that's Interesting. That that's the the rollout is going to happen. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see just how, just which way they took it. You know, there certainly are uh, things in Five E that could be better. Uh, some of it's just like you really needed a copywriter uh, to fix some of the fix some of the writing. But yeah. some of the mechanics could be better. The question is, are they going to fix those things, or are they going to make what was already good worse? Um. 
I, I, I don't know. You know, I hear people talking about 5e now, and it's hit that point where it it's like when I would hear people talking about Pathfinder first edition, just like this alien math language. If you've ever read Fred Saberhagen's Berserker stories, if you haven't, oh, yeah. please do. The Fred Saberhagen's Berserker stories is like mankind's first, like faint indications that there was something out there was this saber he can disguise describes it as this this frightening new voice from deep space that just communicated in hard math <laughs> i i i encountered that it was in high school there you go so yeah, 302 <laughs> so that is what i hear when when pathfinder fans start talking and that is what i hear when when 5e fans start talking so 5e has gotten very bloated and it's like you know my uh sorlock dark elf gish paladin uh 31 strength 22 charisma and i'm just like those rogue, are rogue. words i i do understand that those are words R rogue fighter mage druid ranger yeah yeah, yeah. Half 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 gelatinous cube, half uh drow, and I'm just like, what even is happening to to this game? So hey, whether or not they're going to lance that boil or just to say, okay, well, we're gonna correct a few rules. I guess the question you might be asking is Yang, is it going to be six ed or five point five ed? I don't know. See, I'm, I have a theory. They might call it six, but it'll really be 5.5. Uh, because like I mentioned, people are already invested in all these books. I think they're going to want to keep it as close as possible. So you can sort of use the materials that you already have, you know, so you don't necessarily have to re update all the monsters from your monster manual and things like that. Yeah. Uh, Seventh will be the death March upgrade or die edition. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, isn't it they do the 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 the, the even edition? Oh no, because fourth was an even edition, but it was off step from because it was a five and it was a three and a half. That every other edition, it's like Star Trek movies. Every other edition is, <laughs> you know, this is a slight modification. Oh no, okay, now you really have to get a new set. Oh no, it's a slight modification. Okay, new set time. Well, you know, one E was awesome. Three was, well, it, it was better than late 2e uh, 5e the apology edition for the the mistakes of 4e was okay so i, I i'm guessing by that metric 6e you'll have the suck <laughs> and you'll just have to write it out for seven years me i don't know that i'll be around for 70 but who knows right um but uh anyway that's 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 just my that, that's my take on on what's coming down the pike. Uh, Lorraine, it, I dare I did it again. Cynthia Williams or no Cynthia Williams? Uh, sounds like you have a little PTSD there, Dungeon Deller. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Maybe processing some trauma could be. <laughs> um, can, I, can, I, can I talk about something positive that has nothing to do with this? Sure. I've got, I've got um, a something as well, but you go. This is this is tabletop RPG news, and it's a very short thing. And I just I just want to get this in there. Um, Elvin made in who is over in the audience today, and she she mentioned this over on the Speak Easy, which is a great live stream show for Saturdays. And I I tend to agree with the host. I think it is it is uh, the best every Saturday uh, uh, open live stream uh, for talking about RPG stuff or. It, it it is at least as good as all the others, um, but Elvin Made In is launching a a zine. Uh, she she is she is launching a a zine that's z i z e i n uh, short for magazine, uh, and it is called Tales from the Tavern Magazine. Uh, that's the full name, but Tales from the Tavern is, is the. Uh, uh, is the magazine name and she's an outset on Twitter. I'm excited about that. I love, I love zines like that. Uh, and Emmy, if you can answer just real quick, will it be available in print or as print on demand? Please let us know that. And I, I just, I just wanted to share that. So dungeon minister, please go take the talking stick from me. 
mine mine is is very minor very small um it, this is a, a practical issue and i think of the three of us i don't know yang how, how much uh miniature work you do or did back in the day um i need a glue that will actually hold metal miniatures together and when i was a kid when i was a teenager i had a whole gob of of, of minis and they were all pewter back then right mm -hmm. and we never played with them they just sat on my dresser and they still fell apart. I don't know how that happens. No one touched them and they would just fall apart because of course the metal isn't porous. So there's nothing for the glue to grab onto. And back then I was using um, modeling glue like you'd use for, cause I had like, you know, measure Schmitz and Spitfires and whatnot. Um, and, and the stuff that smelled like oranges, that stuff is what I used and it didn't work. And now I'm using crazy glue and it doesn't work. Soldering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> <Martin. laughs> yeah, yeah. Vaughn's saying solder. Right. Thank you. I can't. Um, I cannot get because I've got. I've got the Bob Johnny miniature, and yes, there is you know a kid playing with it, but we're not like banging them together. They just sit on the table, and the darn arm keeps coming off. And now, the 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 part that came off is a little bump you know a, a, a bump on the the end of the elbow and a divot in the arm to make them fit together and that divot is so full of crusted on super glue i did i just i just bought another one because my life is i'm already in my 50s i don't have enough life left to spend scraping use super glue out of a out of a divot um i have the, the kind used for stone i have two suggestions for you dungeon minister okay. um the first is get a pin vice use uh paper clips and pin you literally drill out a 132 hole in right. each in each body part you slip a bit of paper clip in it you use uh snips to cut that pin down so it fits in the depth of the other hole or if you don't want to drill those out, um, CA glue, crazy glue, and baking soda. Well, and, I know the baking soda speeds it up, but does it strengthen it, it as well? Oh, good lord, yes, absolutely. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, th there's there's a YouTube video. A dude glues two pennies together, and like he he cannot pry them apart. With it with his hands, like he glues them so they overlap, so they're they're like half their their width, and it's it, it forms an incredibly strong bond. So uh, baking soda and super glue, and or pin them. Yeah, I again, not enough life left. To, you know, trying to do that. I think I'm going to go with the baking soda method. <laughs> Try that. Fair. Yang, any suggestions? Uh. No. <laughs> <laughs> if I had more in-person games, uh, I, I might, but um, unfortunately, I do not. I mean, other than, you know, <laughs> I'm just saying it's a good excuse, right? <laughs> the, the miniature would vanish. It would it would vaporize yeah. if you hit it. it anything left. <laughs> well, I'm sure with some practice, you you would be in good shape. You, you can tell your wife it's for work. Or welder. Yeah. I, do you know what I do for a living? I don't know that that's going to fly. <laughs> well, for the YouTube side job, you know. I've got to, I've got to, I've got to solder the cross back together, honey. I got to. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do a little arc welding on the top of the church. Yeah. Well, I have to put the fear of Jesus in some people. Yeah, there we go. Just going to use it for confessions. You what? <laughs> 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 oh, God. So uh, getting back to this comment, uh, I was talking with the Dungeon Delver a few days ago, uh, and we were talking a bit about uh, when you're trying to make your hobby into a business, or at least make some cash with a side hustle. And uh, we were talking about the economics of Patreon versus crowdfunding things. Um, so... Uh, what is your guys' opinions on uh, not 
you know, Watsi or, or any professional company, but what about the average person trying to sell uh, different modules, uh, character classes, uh, or whatnot that um, supports a tabletopping hobby? Hmm. Well, you know, um, there is there is a piece of advice that I read too late that said um, text that said um, only turn your hobby into a business if you want to lose your hobby, right? <laughs> And and there is some truth to it because there's there's a, a point at which you've got to get the next video out. You've got to do that because there are people who've who've actually subscribed. They've actually given you actual money, and um, you know, and they didn't do it just you know, just they they they're expecting to continue to be supporting something that happens, and so you feel a responsibility. And so there is an element of it where you have to be ready to enjoy your work right because it will no longer be a pure hobby um i'm sure both of you have have times when you're like you know i, I i've i need to get i need to push some content out but boy i don't feel like it you know i mean there must be nights i know bill you're five nights a week you must have nights you're like oh crying out loud you know but um so it does it, it does have a a consequence um, That's... and, uh, but uh, hello, wheeling dragon. But, um, so uh, there is, there's a danger to it, you know? Um, but if you are one of the kind of people who can enjoy work, who can get pleasure from something that is a job, um, it's, it's a great way to do it. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for, for me too, there's also, um, if you are, if, for example, if you're running shows where you are doing, uh, online games, right. At some point you have to sit down and you have to write out parts of the adventure and this and that. Um, so for me, why not sell those for the people who would want it? You know, you could do, uh, there's the Patreon, uh, which uh, to me is a bit different than Kickstarter. Usually with Patreon, there's sort of an unspoken, um, an unspoken desire for people to give you money, but to not make it seem like they're giving you money. If you take my <laughs> meaning, like, uh, you know, that's why people will sell like hats and bottle cap. Like I saw someone, yeah. uh, so, someone in comics was selling pogs one time. I was like, who the heck wants pogs? Um, but uh, I remember hogs. I didn't have any, but I remember when they were a thing. Um, but you know, so w when you're doing something like a Patreon, um, of course you want to fulfill your obligations, but people aren't buying things through Patreon like you would on a Kickstarter or through some kind of store. But you know, if it's something that that you could do easily. Mm -hmm. Why not, uh, you know, you, you could do a Patreon and then after a while you could collect all the stuff that you've already put out there, just combine it into one big thing and mm -hmm. do a, a Kickstarter for all the people who missed the Patreon. Yeah, the pa Patreon seem for just my own impressions, um, Kickstarter is I've got an idea for something. I've got a project for something. Mm -hmm. I've got a big thing. Patreon is I'm already doing this and it's an established thing you you already do like you don't start patreon uh, you know you don't announce patreon in your first video on youtube you don't right. you know right it's something that you're already about and then people say i want to support that i want to show support for that in some tangible way uh, there is still i think um well anything you promise it for a tier you know this tier will get mm -hmm. this and this tier will get that you know there's an expectation that it, it happened because they, they subscribed at this level instead of this level for a reason, right. right? No, maybe that reason was, I just really want to show you the extra support, but it, it's also going to be motivated by, oh, yeah, get the mug. Oh, I'll get a mug. Mm -hmm. That's nice, yeah. you know, that kind of thing. So there is still an ex the expectation. Um, the big thing on all of these, though, unless you are talking about it and then you include a, a PayPal link, 
um, even then there's a small amount. All of these things, Patreon and Google memberships, or um, uh, YouTube memberships rather, and um, uh, Kickstarter and Drive Through RPG, all of them are going to take a percentage. Yep. Big, small, you know what that what that percentage is varies, but they're all going to take a big chomp out of your butt. Um, and so, it's it, you're you're actually working for, in a sense, you're working for these companies, you know, and you're getting a you're getting a commission, mm. you know. Kinda, yeah. Well, I I look at more like usury. Like they're putting their claws into you and uh, they're just taking an auto percent of what, of whatever labor you make. Right. But I, I, I personally don't have the banking software to collect credit card and direct deposit, you know, from the globe. So I need, oh, it's super you know, easy. Barely an inconvenience. <laughs> barely an inconvenience. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah. I mean, for me, it's, um, uh, you know, like I said, it's a side hustle. To some extent, it would pay for your hobbies. Like if you're big into painting minis and stuff and people want to give you cash, you know, to support you, that's something you can use to continue on painting bigger and better or more rare minis or yeah. whatever the case may be. Um, you know, and to me, it's the same as if you're already doing the work in some form, like if you're already essentially writing modules, um, yeah. maybe you just have to tweak them a little bit to put them, put them up for sale, but you know, why not? Well, uh, uh, the problem it. is when you, when you have to start making things from scratch and then it takes more time, Yeah, that gets tough. Uh, Va Vaughn mentioned, uh, liking, uh, mini modules, uh, for, mm -hmm. uh, this is a pitch for my Patreon, <laughs> no, but, uh, my, my, uh, eldest boy who plays Fleetwood in our game, he's been doing modules every week this year. He's yeah. put out some miniature mini model modules. Some of them aren't really that many. Some of them get he gets carried away. Um, they're usually one page, two pages. A few of them have gotten pretty long though, and um, yeah, it, uh, it that goes out to the, the the people at a certain level uh, of, of of subscription for my Patreon, and it is the kind of thing that for him. You know, he's a 14 year old boy. He's got all the time mm -hmm. in the world, <laughs> you know, so cranking these out is he loves doing it. He just enjoys doing it. Um, and that's the kind of thing where you tap into something that's already going yeah. on that you're going to do anyway. Yeah, that, that's a lot, a lot easier. So, uh, you know, if he's going to do these every week, are we going to see like at the end of the year, uh, the Honeywood uh, modules, like in a compendium, well, going he, up on he, Kickstarter. He actually Something wrote them to be sort of uh, um, uh, uh, setting agnostic. Uh, ah. the, the stats are back me, um, but oh, okay, you know, yeah, a, a clever individual can modify that. But um, but they're, they're kind of designed to, to, as drop-ins, you mm -hmm. know, so to go into whatever. Um, well, they're not they're not specifically connected to uh, to our thing. But they, the boys have also been drawing pictures of monsters, and then I stat the thing up, and we're assembling a monster manual um, of just various creatures and whatnot. Just, I'm just saying, that's some college money right there. <laughs> well, <laughs> it can't go to a very good school. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a good college, no. That's, just, that's not what he meant. <laughs> the University of Upper Gumboot. <laughs> Uh, I, as far, as far as, you know, uh, as far as that goes, um, you know, making your hobby into your job and you're going to hate your hobby. I mean, I've been doing this for a few years now. I don't hate my hobby of tabletop. Um, I, I keep a very separate, uh, life between the two of, Yes, they're the same thing, but I don't consider this doing my hobby. Do you follow what I'm saying? Right, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I talk about my hobby. Like, you know, if my hobby was painting miniatures, uh, I wouldn't set up a YouTube channel where I feel like I had to do the content that I do about painting miniatures. That would make me hate painting miniatures. 
but talking about D and D and talking to people and interacting with people on the internet is not my hobby. My hobby is playing D and D. And yes, I do play D and D on live streams and that sort of thing. But that's that's extra. That that's a little extra cheese on the pizza, right? Um, so I don't. They're related, but they're not the same. I guess is what I'm saying. Like I don't feel a compulsion to bring and because there, there's stuff I do in my Monday night game. Like I used to talk about my Monday night game some way back on some early videos. You'll find me like doing updates and then I just stopped because mm-hmm. seemed like nobody really cared. But um, and I try and gauge that what people like versus what they don't like. I mean, I I came close to stopping the Gamma World games on Friday night because nobody was watching them. And last night we topped out at like 36, which is pretty good numbers for me. I realize there's people that live stream that are like, I have 30 feet, 36 people hopping on and off like every couple of minutes, bud. Um, but uh, <laughs> the welding again. Um, but, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I feel, or, or am I just that far behind? I'm sorry. Oh, I'm way far behind. Right. I had the, I had the, the live broadcast up. So I saw the welding stuff come up again. Um, but anyway, to go back to what I was saying, uh, I don't let this wear on my hobby. I don't let this, this grind me uh into a feeling of i just don't want to do this there are nights and dungeon minister uh (laughs) was like private private messaging me one night he's like man you you got a like a thousand yard stare you sure you need to be doing this and god bless him uh you know i i kind of learned from that and I, i i i i don't stream when i when when things are bad you know don't make martyrs out of my out of my bad feelings um, so, you know, I, I don't, I don't worry about burnout because if my hobby was doing YouTube stuff and then I decided to make it a job that would burn me out, but it's not my, my hobby is tabletop gaming. I just happen to YouTube about it and they're, they're very separate things. Like, you know, if I went from game store to game store around Orlando because people were paying me to show up and play D&D games and that was my job, that would be my hobby becoming a job. And yeah, that would grind me down. But there are just times when I just have to, I, I just think things have gone so completely off the rails that doing a live stream is not even in question. That was Wednesday night. Or Thursday was it Wednesday or Thursday? I don't even remember here. Now I think it was when Thursday night. You know, Thursday. I was just like, I can't do this. I am completely short circuited. I'm not gonna. Just, you know, I will give a, uh, I will give a good show or I will give no show. So that that's that's just my take on it. That's just, that's just how I do. And good night, Emmy. Thank you for hanging out with oh. us. Good night. Thanks for coming. Look forward to seeing the zine. Absolutely. It's 138. Oh, in the UK. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, we've been, we've been going on for going on for a good stretch here. Yeah. All right. Yeah, well, I, I I think the 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 economics of it is never going to um yeah, there's a it's one of these 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 websites that that monitors social media platforms, and it'll give you all sorts of statistics, um, and uh, and it'll tell you an estimation of what this person is earning mm-hmm. in you know YouTube revenue and whatnot. And I looked at that and I thought, wow, I should be doing better than that <laughs> from YouTube, <laughs> um, you know. But it it it's operating on metrics that don't. I don't know if they've updated their algorithm since the adpocalypse happened or what, because nobody with my sub count is making that kind of money off of YouTube. No. Um, no. So you have to, you have to know that it's going to be like an extra candy bar or so. If you do live chats and you get people doing um, super chats, that's, that yeah. actually becomes, you know, real money. It's not make a living money, but it's, um... you know, it's, 
I don't know. I don't know. I, there's yeah. a lot of people in the comic oh. world who, you know, it almost seems like they're YouTubers who occasionally sell some yeah. merch that is a comic. Uh, yeah. They get yeah, there's, that's tons a whole of other, merch. That's a whole other end of the spectrum. I, I'm talking for the sort of, you know, Oh yeah, yeah. Small yeah. to mid size. You're not, uh, you're not making it big. You get to Viva La Dirt League level, then yeah, you're making your living doing it. Yeah, but that's a whole other, that's a whole other story. Um, for the vast majority of YouTube channels, it's it's, you know, it's it's popcorn candy bar kind of money. Yeah, and and that's and that's like, for me though, what it does is it it, it allows me to to talk to my wife, who's forever, you know, I mean. Canada, I don't know what the, the economy is doing down there, but it's not great here. And uh, yeah, so being able to, to to go to my wife and say, yes, but it's not costing us anything. <laughs> you know, all of these craft supplies, I got them using the money that the Patreon, the patrons gave me. So it's not costing us anything for this dragon miniature. You know. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's funny. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was going to say when I when I first got married, uh, my my wife had made some comments about uh I had a group that I was playing in the Dungeons and Dragons campaign with. Um, and uh, I said, yes, but this hobby is a lot cheaper than drinking. And I'm not getting drunk around girls at a bar. And she's yeah. like, okay, I like it's, this it, hobby now. It, it really increases the chances that there will be no girls involved at all. Really? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Well, I mean, the, the girl, the girls uh, matter aside, um, I almost said the girl parts and we can't <laughs> anyway. Um, <laughs> but, <laughs> um, but that matter aside, you know, uh, it does bring up an interesting thing talking about the economics of this hobby uh, as players, um, you know, at least back in the day, Dungeons and Dragons, that, that was about a dog fall for, uh, for parents because one purchase was required, mm -hmm. a basic set or, you know, maybe three books or something like that. Gas. We had stagflation back then. Look it up, kids. It's uh, was about as bad as it is now um, where wages weren't going up, but inflation was going up. So a trip to the movies, popcorn, other snacks, do that three, four times a year. And you paid for the cost of the D and D books, and the D and D books. The kids are going to be happy every weekend, or if they if they really really lose their their minds about it, three four nights a week, right? So people and during times of economic and social stress, people want to take their brains off the hook. Mm -hmm. All right. They want to they want to escape somewhere. It's escapism that they desire. It's something they can forget about the 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 troubles of the world. They can escape into it. So it's a good investment. And you do you did see D and D sales going up throughout the Carter uh, uh, recession and the Reagan recession. D and D sales were huge. Yeah. you know video games quickly overtook and surpassed but people were still willing to go to toys r us and the local hobby shop and the toy aisle at ben franklin and the supermarket and wherever fine games and hobbies were sold to buy D, &D because it was an investment it was a one-time investment and people were wanted more bang for their buck and they wanted the hell away from the troubles of the world uh, and, you know, uh, not to say that it's uh, just held to that era. Uh, I mean, we more or less saw the same thing just a few years ago with COVID. Yeah. Yeah. Partly because yeah. you couldn't leave your house. And it's yeah. Yeah. You can, you can <laughs> play in this format. Uh, yeah. But, uh, but, yeah. No, I, I, yeah. I actually wonder if it, if it weren't for the, the pandemic, if... Well, my boys probably still would have asked the questions because we I got into it because they were asking about what I did, what I played when I was younger, what games I played, what things that you know. But um, I want I, I wonder if we'd have launched the campaign, and if we had, I wouldn't have had time to start the channel, right? Like I'm finding now mm -hmm. because everything's opened again, and I'm, I'm visiting people in hospital, not with this cold, but you know, visiting people in hospital and whatnot, that. 
that I, I have less and less time. So yeah. to start it up, I don't think it would have happened. Like what happened? So yeah, it does. It, that, that did like hit a big pause on everything. And so what am I going to do? Well, let's, let's play this game, you know, all absorbing, time consuming, obsessive, detail oriented game. Yeah, and I very true. Would I would I have gone? I mean, I had the Delver's Dungeon YouTube channel. Would I have gone just all in like I did? Yeah. I I don't know. It might still be sitting there with you know a half dozen videos, one uploaded like clockwork every four months. <laughs> you know, uh, I just I I I don't know. That's one of those things that that, that we simply we can't know because what happened happened. Um, but here we are, right? <laughs> this is true. So on that note, gentlemen, what do you have coming up in the next month? Well, I have a, um, I'm getting close to 2000 subs and I just put out, um, a video for patrons and it's going to go live for but it's going to go public tomorrow about my plans for what i'm going to do to celebrate 2000 and that's going to be an enormous piece of work um mm -hmm. getting um and then getting ready for next saturday um next weekend and actually next weekend uh the big the big event online the guac the guac, the guac. so uh dungeon delver can yeah. people still get into games on the guac or is it locked? No, it's not locked. Uh, I, I don't do that. Shut down the grid and shut down game mastering. Uh, I will probably not do that until late Wednesday. So if you look up and you think there's a time slot on Saturday, uh, Thursday, Friday, or Saturday, uh, you've got till Wednesday. I'm going to say now you've got till midnight Wednesday. That is Wednesday into Thursday, not Tuesday into Wednesday, um, to to get a game in the grid. I'm going to be putting my games in the grid, of course. I've been saying I'm going to do that. I've been hella busy, but I'm going to be putting my game in the grids. Um, so that's going to happen. Um, but the great underground online gaming convention is next week. Now, I was not going to stream much next week, a Monday show and a Tuesday show, but I have added an early evening Wednesday show because uh, Aggie from uh, Brave Alice, uh, I owe him an interview, so he's going to be on talking about RPG stories and their latest revisions. Um, and uh, Harmony Ginger, uh, who is... Uh, a wonderful lass I met over on Twitter, and she's actually proximate to me, uh, but she will be on the show on Monday night. We'll be doing an early evening to later evening uh, live stream on Monday, which is very rare. I, I don't, uh, I, I typically don't have guests on Monday night because that runs right into my AD&D campaign. Um, and so we're going to have, uh, we, we've got Wednesday to Sunday, we have got an enormous amount of convention time at the guac um you guys you can still register for it uh the great underground online gaming convention uh yang i will put the link over here real quick if you want to put that up on screen um, right. we have merch dungeon minister has done a uh another round of merch for us and you can still get old merch for the guac also I I did not do the art this time, though. The art took, um, a, took a, nice. a drastic step upward. <laughs> Nonsense. Uh, Sky Hernstrom, who will be appearing on the show in May. Uh, I have quite the lineup of players for May, but uh, Sky Hernstrom did the logo this uh, this time around. Uh, so uh, Flint wants a link to... It's right there, uh, just, just above your message. Um so uh, definitely, definitely, definitely check us out. Um, it, guys, it costs zero. Your travel cost is zero. If you want to drink expensive craft beers and eat uh, a, a, and eat event food that costs an arm and a leg, that's on you. Unless you want to buy merch, this costs you nothing. So 
So please do come in, check out, play games, sign up to run games. You've still got until uh, midnight on Wednesday night to to sign up to run games. And I'm going to leave the registration open, guys. I'm going to leave the registration open. So uh, if you want to jump into a game, just make sure that it has seats, of course. Uh, I think Warhorn will automatically kick you out. Uh, if you try and sign up, for that. So, just not, there's no space to sign up. So, if if a game is full, it's full, and you can't. Yeah, yeah. there you go, there you go. So, um, so plenty of opportunities to play. Still plenty of opportunities to sign up and run. That's all happening with me next week. So, you know, a typical Bill Sylvie week. Nice, calm, relaxing. No stress at all. <laughs> ah, nice Florida sunset week. Um, nice. Monday night, I have Joe Catapano coming on. He's talking about a new comic he is making, Star Circuit Issue 2. Uh, the basic overall theme is Space Motorcycle Race. Uh, so that is pretty fun. A little bit of a manga-ish look. Great art. Uh, and then on Wednesday, I've got Vaughn Coleman coming out with his debut book called, if I can pronounce it right, Phenomenova. Uh, so his the art in the book looks fantastic. So check that out as well. And I think the week after, I will have one or two guests in the gaming realm. But announcements forthcoming. Excellent. Sounds like fun. And also two weeks from now, we will see what sort of new character I have for Gamma World. That's right. Because the last Gamma. one was horribly murdered last night. Horribly murdered. Hey, you messed with the bull and you got the horns. <laughs> the particle beam horns. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, then, everyone, I think we will adjourn this meeting and come yeah, back good. next month to renew our plans to dominate the world. Yes. All right, everyone, good night. Links in the chat and also in the description to this video to the guac. Peace.